uh, in the mid-1994, uh, we saw my husband and I lived in Silicon Valley. Uh, we were, um, I was lucky enough to be, become an exchange student at Stanford and uh, I came across Mosaic. And Mosaic was the first browser and uh, my husband and I, who is also a computer scientist, we saw, wow, now something big is gonna happen. The world is gonna change because we had known the internet and we knew, wow, let's take the internet to Germany, which we did. Only to, to find out that nobody knew what the hell is the internet and uh, nobody had internet access. And so anyway, so we solved this problem um, and uh, started the first internet company that went public on the German stock exchange. And uh, because I was born across the border from, uh, from here in Romania, I, um, I grew up bitter poor. I went to school without food. My toes are crooked, my teeth are broken um, because I didn't have the right anything. My, we only had an outdoor bathroom. Um, and so when you end up um, having an, an exit, an IPO, then you say, oh my God. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, my marriage started being on the rocks. I thought, are we gonna get divorced or what? Because uh, we could not integrate that poverty. So if you're poor, you wanna get out of poverty and all of a sudden, all this stuff, whatever. And so that was the first time when I asked myself these questions. Like what takes transformation? How do you uh, integrate the inner with the outer? And this presentation of mine is basically trying to show you my journey as a, a serial entrepreneur and an investor that is actually trying to do this exactly in the investment world, in the business world, building what we call integrally sustainable companies. And um, I, came across the Ken Wilber's integral model and no, nobody actually know, I know a few people in the room know, um, as a model that helped us, helps us integrate um, the, the true, the good, and the beautiful. The, the Greeks already had it, um, and, uh, but we actually eliminated it over, I don't know, 300 years ago, Descartes helped us, and before that we only had the church ruling the world. So this is basically what helped me um, become successful. And the reason why I'm saying I invented this uh, theta model in investing and I put the 6.8 return on investment is not to impress you. I put it down to impress upon you that if you integrate people, planet, and profit with your own passion and purpose, you are also uh, scientific, um, financially successful. And so this should help us get those people who believe that you have to make money at the expense of everything else. This is in my own little, small, very insignificant way, we were able to prove the opposite. And uh, so, again, uh, my background is artificial intelligence, but, and I studied that back in 19, in the early 80s, um, but I had to go back to school to get my PhD in psychology, actually in transpersonal psychology, uh, because I needed to stand on two feet. I needed to learn how do I take this thinking, how do I take this thought into investing? And I just had a conversation with Lisa Petraitis, uh, who basically told me that she's actually experiencing in the educational world they were trying to transform here, what I had experienced back in 20 years ago, and I try to apply this in the investment world. How do you change the system in a system that is already rotten? Rotten in a sense that we either have the opportunity to transform education as an NGO, uh, or as a for-profit, which is what's currently happening. And so the structures, the systems that we have, we need to change them because otherwise you can't put it forward. You can't integrate, you can't make that transformation. So this is maybe a way to do that. So um, my intention is what is the context in which we operate and uh, the other is what is the key to transformation? And of course, we've already all uh, heard that. And what is the future of education and the role in what I see? And by the way, those of you who are interested in going into more detail as to how um, I'm doing it, there is a, a panel that I'm gonna give a little bit more insight uh, tomorrow. So what is the context? We have already heard that we have three major uh, threats. It's climate change, is um, Artificial intelligence, Ray Kurzweil, although I, I think he's a very smart man, and uh, technical singularity, so, and then AI in, applied a nuclear threat. So it's not that simple. 
And being a member in the Club of Rome, uh, we get told all the time, yep, yep, it's climate, stupid, let's do it. And uh, it took us 50 years uh, not to achieve what actually Greta Thunberg achieved in a year because the time was right. And the question that I asked myself as a, as a company builder, as an investor, how in the world am I taking this, am I applying this into the everyday, like you, when you teach? How do you do that? Day in and day out. These are big thoughts, but how did, you know, I, I still have a physical body, how do I work? How do I um, have an impact? And so, these are the questions that I ask myself, and uh, we have on the global level, we have two major achievements, the Paris Accord and the 17 UN uh, SDGs, but there are 17. And if you talk to people, education is one of them, they will tell you, oh, I pick one, three, and 11. What about the rest? Don't we have to implement them all in order to be successful? And last year during the Club of Rome event, in, that we had in, 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 at the Vatican. The, um, Jorgen Renders, Rockström, and other amazing, amazing people um, came up with the paper that I highly, highly recommend. Um, and I do not agree with Jorgen Renders, by the way. Jorgen Renders is one of the in, in, initial authors, one of the four authors um, who wrote Limits to Growth back uh, in 1972. Um, but he says, uh, what we are doing is too little, little and too late. Well, if that is true, let's cure ourselves. And I, I won't do that because there is a bigger picture. He does not know. He is not connected to the inner side of himself because otherwise he would not dare to take us the hope away. And I'm here to give us hope. All of you are probably here to give each other hope because that's what we need. That's what's gonna take us further. So how do we integrate within the, how do we integrate UN SDGs within the context of exponential technologies? And we know from Peter Diamandis, the moral speed of change will make us look like we're crawling today, and that's true, unfortunately. And how do we take such exponentially growing curves. This is uh, back in the mid 90s when uh, we took the internet to Germany. Uh, this is the slide that we show people how the internet was growing. That's the exponential curve. And if you go deeper, this is what's actually changing our world. And this is a representation for our human ability not to get it because we're linear loker thinkers, but technology goes exponentially and acts globally. So this is the major challenge that we have as humans. And this is a major help that will come through AI if applied in a proper way. I am convinced of that and we need to join them. If you can't beat them, join them. And this is what I'm doing. And what is this? Who has already seen this curve? People in the Silicon Valley have already, yes, of course. This is the evolution of technology over the past 100 years. And most people say when they refer to exponential tech, they refer to Moore's Law. But if you look at it, Moore's Law is new. It's only the fifth evolution. So what I'm trying to tell you here, this exponential evolution of tech has, doesn't, has not seen any wars. We had several wars last century, major, two major ones. You can see that. What this tells me, people will continue to provide the dollars, the money, to evolve this technology because it's exciting for many reasons. So let's join them. Here is another, so it's uh, electromechanical relay, vacuum tube, transistor, and then integrated circuits. This is a, a much more readable uh, slide for that same statement. And uh, of course, the five, the six Ds of singularity, everyone is familiar with them, I, su I suppose. Um, I need to go a little faster to keep within the time frame. And here's the report that I've referred to you and that I highly recommend. And I would like to, um, to thank um, Jürgen Renders and Rockström for giving me these slides because this is research based on data that's been collected over the past 50 years and they have done a new simulation that help us implement the UN SDGs. 
within the next 11 years. And here's what they came up with. The most important thing is to implement the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries. There is no point in picking and choosing number one, no poverty, which is what the, you know, the Chinese have done and the, uh, the North Koreans and so on over the past uh, decades, and implement no poverty at the expense of the planet number 13, right? So we need to work together. And so this has to occur within the planetary boundaries, and you see there are nine of them. I won't be able to go into the details, but that contains the ocean acidification. Biosphere needs, you know, the operating system. We need air to breathe. And so the UN SDGs need to be implemented within planetary boundaries, but if you look at what we're currently doing, we're not doing this. And this informs actually my action, my activities, my investment decisions every single day. So if you look at, um, on the y-axis, you see the number, uh, the nine planetary boundaries. This is an important slide. If you go away with one slide from my presentation from this session, this is it. If you look at the planetary boundaries, there are nine of them. And you see at the top, there is the green at nine. And at the X um, axis are the UN SDGs, the number of the UN SDGs that are implemented at any one single time. And what we want to do, we want to operate within the green colors. Green at the top and green at the, at the, on the right-hand side. So we want, want more planetary boundaries being fulfilled and more UN SDGs being implemented. So what have we done? What have we, in the 1980s, we started implementing, this is the data simulated by, uh, from, uh, from the Stockholm Resilience Center. So in the 1980s, we were still operating in the green planetary boundaries. Then we started going down the tubes. And if we continue, we will be able to implement by 2050 about 11 UN SDGs, but we will have left, and we already are there, the planetary boundaries of the planet. What happens, and this is the simulation um, of the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center based on the data collected over the past, past 50 years, what happens if we move faster in this direction? We won't be able to achieve much more. The same will occur if we move harder, and you can find the details on, in the report. But there is a way, and this is what gives me a lot of hope, there is a smart way that will be able to take us up uh, back into the operating system of the planet that uh, will ensure our survival. And I hope we will thrive too. So what are the five transformational policies? So we don't have, we don't have 17, we only have five, which need to be focused on for the past, for the next 10, 11 years, 10 years in the meantime. So everything that you do should fit in here. One, accelerated renewable energy growth. Number two, accelerated productivity in food chain. We need to feed the people on this planet. Number three, new development models. So we need to copy what was right in the models developed by China, North, uh, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, and others. What have they done right to help those who are currently developing of course, we need to reduce inequality. Um, this is something that I, you know, I do it in my own little way, but I'm not a politician. And here's number five. This is where education falls. This is what we're doing right now. This is why this is so important. The role of education, particularly as it applies to gender equality, to women and family planning. The difference between an educated woman and one that is not educated, educated 12 years of education and one that is not, is 4.5 children. That's the impact of education in terms of footprint. And of course my intention is uh, what is the key to transformation and you all have the answer. What is it? A mind shift. Today we have e economy at the bottom instead of biosphere and the society is somewhere uh, nowhere. So we need to tip it to go upside down. Education must support this. And here is, um, before I ask you what, uh, what is the mind shift, uh, what does it, how do we get there? And here is an example. Uh, that's why I, you know, I went back and got my PhD in psychology because I wanted to know what makes us function. Maslow Pyramid, most people know it. And of course, 
this is evolution. This takes time. Those of you who have children or no children know how difficult that is because it's only at the top of the pyramid that we have a world-centric mindset. As long as we're at the bottom, we're egocentric, ethnocentric, not much will change because we'll protect ourselves and our own interests and not the world's, not the planet. So this is hard work. However, we do implement it. I do implement it. I in, we integrate traditional investing with traditional philanthropy. This is, this is the schizophrenia right there. And if you look at what's happening since the 1980s, impact investing came along and tried to integrate it. But within impact investing themselves, you have schizophrenia. So, oh, financial first. No, impact first. And the truth, the truth is integral investing is everything. The parity. I love to use them, use the six Ps, the parity of people, planet, and profit with passion and purpose. Because you, yourself, is also important. And of course, the future or role of education. Um, I actually brought along, and I'd like to finish with that, a quote um, that I that I read recently in a recent conversation on artificial intelligence with, uh, with Elon Musk. Alibaba's founder Jack Ma stated that he is quite optimistic about the future. Ma insisted that only college people are scared of AI. <laughs> Street smart people like him or not, Ma continued, AI can help people gain more self-confidence because through it they could begin to understand themselves and each other better. When people know themselves better, they will be smarter and they will be wiser. And with that, they can begin to improve the world and make life more, more uh, sustainable, unquote. In response to Jack Ma, Elon Musk, who believe that, believes that humanity is a biological bootloader for digital superintelligence, he's very worried about AI, so am I. Um, he said, famous last words, referring to Jack Ma. And um, I personally believe, and we could talk about this over lunch, uh, that both are right. I believe that, um, it, yes, the answer is consciousness evolution. And the answer is we need to collectively decide what's good for our planet and use AI to become, to be beneficial rather than destroy us. So, yes, I applaud uh, Elon Musk who's taking the Mona Lisa maybe to Mars if we destroy it, um, if we destroy it on this planet. But I, I believe in the meantime, we have so much to do and um, I'm deeply grateful to be in this group uh, because um, we, can, we can do it, we can all do it. There's so much collective intelligence here and more, more than intelligence, more than cognitive intelligence, uh, there's so much heart and um, it's an honor and a privilege and I thank you for your time. Thank you.